The GRE math subject test often has problems that test the conceptual understanding of an idea rather than its implementation. And this problem right here, which is from the current GRE math subject test book, is a great example of the understanding of the nuances of the definition of the limit rather than its implementation, the delta epsilon definition that is. So we're gonna dive in and check out how to solve this problem. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar with Prof Omar Math. On this channel, we discuss undergraduate theorems and problems for your road through the undergraduate and to prepare you for the road beyond. If this resonates with you, definitely click the subscribe button and join our community. Today we're going to talk about this problem that shows up on the GRE math subject test, which is a test that's used as a precursor to admissions to math graduate schools uh, and many different mathematics programs. And this problem looks at the definition of a limit, but does a little twist on it. And I think the purpose of it is to get a sense of students who understand the nuances of how the definition works in terms of the quantifiers and what the delta and epsilon actually mean. So let's go ahead and read the problem. Um, it says, a real valued function f defined on the real numbers has the following property. For every epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of f of x minus f of one is greater than epsilon when the absolute value of x minus one is greater than or equal to delta. So we see that already this is a little bit of a play on the definition of a limit, which would have something like these, quant these inequalities here switched um, and instead of a greater than or equal to, we have a strictly uh, less than in that direction. Um, so you're given options of what the answer is to what this definition is encapsulating. And it asks whether or not it encapsulates f being continuous at x equals one, discontinuous, unbounded, um, something that looks a little bit different than unbounded, we'll unpack this in a second, and then something about an integral of f from zero to infinity. Okay, so here's what I suspect happens on the test usually. People will look at this and think, uh, okay, this looks like the definition of a limit, and I don't have much time to answer questions, so I'm just gonna answer that it's the definition of continuity in some weird disguise. Another thing that might happen, and I think this will probably happen quite a bit on the test, is uh, you look at this and it looks like you're reversing all of the conditions in continuity, so it must mean that this means discontinuity. But again, I think the thing to do with an example like this, which is also the thing to do when you first learn the definition of a limit in analysis or a theoretical calculus course, is to play with values for epsilon and delta to get a sense of what actually is really going on in the problem. So we're gonna do that with this particular statement and then get a sense of what this actually implies about the function f itself. Okay, so let's play around with this for a bit, and I wanna actually pick values for epsilon and delta to get a sense of what's going on. So let's start with the value epsilon equal to one. All right, so what this is saying is that when I pick epsilon to be one, there is a delta for which when x minus one in absolute value is greater than or equal to delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus the f of one is greater than or equal to one. Okay, so let's unpack what this means by actually unpacking the absolute values. So this statement here is saying that x minus one is either greater than or equal to delta or x minus one is less than or equal to negative delta. So another way to word this is that x is at least delta away from the number one. So if we were to look at the graph of this function, we look at x equals one, there's some width delta. The values of x that satisfy this are the values outside of this range here. And what we're saying is when x is in that large ra range, the things out far away from the value one, then f of x is far away from f of one. So we're saying here that f of x minus f of one is at least one, or f of x minus f of one is less than or equal to negative one. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, so for values of x outside this range, we have that f of x is at least, so here's our point one f of one. Um, Maybe this value here is f of one plus one, and here's f of one 
minus one, and we're saying, or it should be a little bit down actually, we have f of one over here, so maybe f of one minus one is over here. And so we're saying that when x is in this range, that f has to be either above this line or below this line. Okay, so what happens then as we make this epsilon larger? Let's look at this picture again when epsilon is chosen to be something like the number 7 or maybe even something like 100. So I'll make this 100 now. So what we're saying is if we drew the graph again, here is our value 1, again our point 1 f of 1. Uh, so maybe our delta would be something like this. So we're saying when x is outside of this, this interval right over here, then f is very far away from f of 1. So f might be like somewhere, like I can't even draw it, it's off the charts right over here. It's going to be either way up here or way down here. So we're seeing from the picture by interpreting directly what this statement is saying that no matter what value we pick over here, right? Let's say we pick 3 million. If we want the values of f of x to be at least 3 million away from f of 1, we can do that by enforcing that x is sufficiently far away from the value 1, right? So as we are getting further and further away from one, we're seeing that the function is becoming very, very large or very, very small. Okay, so now we can get an interpretation of what that is in terms of the choices. That doesn't seem like continuity or discontinuity at one because what is happening is we're talking about values that are far away from one and how F either blows up positively or negatively. Um, you might think that this implies that f is unbounded, so that's a possible choice. Um, and then how do we unpack what this thing is saying? So this is saying that as x, the absolute value of x goes to infinity, the absolute value of f of x goes to infinity as well. If we look at the condition we have here, when x is large in either direction, we get that f blows up in either direction. And that seems to be most reminiscent with choice D, um, where we have x moving in both directions and something happening with the absolute value of x, which means either f in the positive or the negative f. Um, okay, so the key here, which is tricky, is if you look at choice C, it says f is unbounded. But the question here is what's actually equivalent to this statement? And if you think about unboundedness, you could be unbounded in one, by being unbounded in one direction and not the other. So for example, your graph could look something like the graph of e to the x, which blows up when you go to the right, but actually converges to zero when you go to the left. Right? In that case, we don't have this phenomenon happening when we go to the left, right? So when x is in the range where it's less than one minus delta, um, we're not gonna have this phenomenon where the function blows up. So that eliminates choice C as a possibility. Okay, so we kind of have ruled out everything except for D and E. D seems the most reminiscent to the, the actual um, figure that we're seeing. And so if you're actually on the test, you might think um, maybe I should try to figure out what's going on with E. At this point, it might actually make sense to just jump and choose D as an answer because you've only left yourself with two things and you're not penalized for choosing the wrong thing. That might give you more time to work on other problems. With D though, one thing you can recognize is um, having a function whose integral is infinite doesn't say anything about the function itself being bounded in any way. 
Um, and here we have a function that is forced to be unbounded, whereas in the integral, we can get um, an integral that is infinite, even though the actual function might be bounded in one direction. So an example of such a thing is like the integral of one over X. Okay, so that gives us an idea of how to approach this problem. I think this problem is very interesting because its main goal, I think, is really to test the understanding of how to read things like the definition of a limit. If you happen to know a little bit about the definition of the limit going to infinity, there's a little bit of an augmentation of that. But even if you don't, um, this is a great problem for testing that understanding. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more videos like this on undergraduate theorems and problems that are useful for your undergrad journey and your journey beyond, uh, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.